And as you can see, the person on this graphic uh, is all in. Jumping off a cliff to swim, I told him I want something that's an extreme sport where a person can see that once you make that commitment to jump in, there's no turning back. In your life, what are you all in about? What are you all in? Now, I'll tell you, my temptation is not to be fully committed. My temptation is to be partially in, halfway devoted. But in order to make a real difference in the world, a significant difference, you must be all in, totally committed, totally engaged. And I think there are, there are ways of thinking that lead to that. Now, I call this sermon at the beginning the positive power of desperation. Can you say that with me, please? Come on. The positive power of desperation. But that didn't capture it all. So I called it all in thinking for the month. And today, I want to show you two desperate people. And the desperation drove them to be all in. And sometimes that's what it takes. Some of you are complaining about a trial or a difficulty, but that difficulty is really helpful to you because it's stirred up something in you. There's a wonderful guy named John Carter who wrote a book on change. It's called Leading Change. And this is one of my, my books that I call, <laughs> it's like a foundational book, a book I, everybody should read, Leading Change by John Carter. And he says there are eight things that lead to change in your life. And the first one is a sense of urgency. You have to have a sense of urgency, a personal drive that makes you different. So that's why if you're with somebody and they comment on your hair or your body, when next time you go out with them, you check yourself before you see them. That sense of urgency. When you run out of money, when you run up against a challenge, it drives you. That's, that, that, that has helped me in my life. I've... I've, I've, I've seeing what happens when I don't say anything. I've seen what happens when I don't try. And, and that sense of urgency pushes me. So in this um, series, my goal is to help you improve your thinking. That's my goal all year long. And that will improve your outcomes. It's going to protect your future. So there are four sermons, really five. Lord, help me. I'm going to give you five things I'm going to talk about this month. You ready? Number one, repeat it with me. Say, all in thinking. Today we talk about the, power, the positive power of desperation. I'm going to show you how desperation drove two people to be all in. Next week we'll talk about checked out thinking. Say that with me, please. Come on. Have you ever felt forgotten? Have you ever felt that you were, you were totally ignored and that nobody saw you? Checked out thinking. There was a guy who had every reason to believe that everyone had checked out, that he was forgotten about. In his crisis. Thirdly, we'll talk about let's go thinking. Come on, say that with me, please. I love this sermon. It's called Asking, Seeking, Knocking. Say those three. Come on. Asking, Seeking. If you don't ask, if you don't seek, if you don't knock, you're never going to get there. It's going to be a great study. You'll enjoy that one. Number four, repeat this, please. Say unstable thinking. Unstable thinking. <laughs> if you have people who change all the time, they like you, they don't like you, they're up, they're down, it's always something. And if I'm honest, there are times I'm tempted to be unstable in my thinking. I have to learn to be consistent. I, I, was, I, was, I asked myself questions all the time, and I, I had this great question that came to my mind the other day. What have you not done that you think affected you in a negative way? What did you do, rather, that affected you in a negative way? And one of the answers that came to my mind was I didn't stick with the plan. I had a goal. I set a goal. I was going to pay this off or do this or do that and didn't do it. And I find that when, I, when I'm unstable and I'm, yes, I'm going to be committed. No, I'm not. I'm up, I'm down all the time. You never finish. I checked myself just yesterday. I said, no, Temple, uh-uh, stop. That wasn't the plan. Uh-uh, no, no, that's not what you said. Here's what you said. You're not eating that except on the weekends. I need you to pause. You made a commitment. I need you to stick with the plan. There's a reason for this. Then lastly, on Easter Sunday, I love this one, say resurrected thinking. Resurrected. It's amazing how they thought on the other side of the resurrection. It's amazing how they went from unstable thinking on Palm Sunday to resurrected thinking on the, on the day after the resurrection. It's a powerful study. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be great studies. Turn with me to Luke chapter 8, verse 41. I'm going to show you an individual 
who was desperate, two stories in one. It's one of those unique times in the Bible where these stories dovetail together, and I want you to listen carefully to how it's worded. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue. Please notice his title. This is a guy in charge. And he fell down at Jesus' feet, and he begged. Think about this. A leader guy in charge who's begging to come to his house. Pause for a minute. Think with me. Why would a guy do this? What would make a guy who is a leader guy in charge see Jesus come in, fall at his feet, and beg, please come to my house? Here's why. Parents, you'll get this. Verse 42. We had, he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. Wow. But as he went, the multitudes thronged him. They were all around him, touching him. And while the crowd is yelling his name, think about this for a minute. While the crowd is yelling his name and they're, they're, they're grabbing on his clothes and they're pulling at him, while all that's going on, there's one guy who's, who's yelling above the crowd, please come to my house. Now, this is not the time for visitations. I, I understand what it's like when people talk to you and they think they're the only one trying to talk to you. But in this context, it's so powerful, if you can imagine it, they're, they're running at Jesus, it, it's, it's people yanking on his clothes, and, and he is hearing this guy yell, come to my house. My daughter's dying. Now, I have a daughter, and I have a son, and I, I'm, I love both of my kids, and I, I, I do. I have granddaughters, too, and I have two of them. And um, there's, there's something special about kids that you love. And your daughter, and I, for me, I remember uh, Christina in our life, and I, I, I so want to get this book out, the one that she and I were writing together. And I'm, I'm just so, um, I'm so convinced that it will help people to see into the relationship between a father and a daughter when it's healthy and the seasons that you go through and the changes you go through. But there's nothing like looking at your daughter there's nothing like looking in her eyes and um, those conversations, that sense of protection you have, that sense of connection. Some of you say, I never had that, but it's okay. Let me, let me tell you, it's pretty cool when it works right. Well, he's desperate. He's down to his last option. And this is a guy everybody knows, and he's begging. Have you ever been desperate like that? And this guy is all in. He's made a decision. I'm going to go talk to Jesus. He's made a decision. I'm not going to let my daughter die. He's made a decision. I'm going to try. He's made a decision. And he is all in. I love it. But while he's all in, he's not the only guy. Sometimes when you're going through a trial, you think you're the only one. You ever felt that way? Nobody goes through what you're going through. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Right? It's only you. And so if you're not careful, you come at it with this biased approach and you think you're the only one. But while he's desperate, there's somebody else desperate. Right in this room, there's somebody else sick too. You're the only one got a bad diagnosis. You're not the only one with a problem. You're not the only one with money issues. You're not the only one trying to start a business. You want to feel that way. This isn't the only church in the city. We're not the only people doing good stuff. Other people are doing things too. If you're not careful, you think you're the only one. Sometimes people just don't tell you. But right next to him, somewhere in that crowd was a woman. We had a long-term problem. Listen to this, verse 43, same chapter. This is Luke chapter 8, verse 43. This is amazing. And a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who has spent all her livelihood on physicians, could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment. And immediately, her flow of blood stopped. I want to pause there for a minute. Have you ever had an embarrassing illness? You ever had one that you hope nobody sees or knows about? See, guys, you're like me. You don't know about no flow of blood. Crickets. <laughs> I didn't really know until I got married. I didn't fully understand details, you know, what was going, what was really happening. 
because my mother just didn't feel necessary, necessary to just discuss, discuss that with me. And plus, I would say, hey, stop, girl. Hey, stop. I would have told her. I'll, I'll read about it. You know, I would have told her. I really, I didn't, I didn't want that. I, we didn't have that. We didn't have no birds, bees, uh, nothing conversation. I just watched TV, <laughs> movies, <laughs> movies. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I'm telling you, I, I was, uh, you know, I, I didn't know. And so I got married. And then you go, oh, okie dokie. And you start asking questions. So let me understand. So one, two, three, okay, and then on this, and then that happened. Oh, yeah, all the time. <laughs> like, yeah, really, oh, all the time. This is like a repeating event. <laughs> all the time. And then if you have a problem with this, you can have issues, shall I not describe them, that can be embarrassing, shall I not describe them. And, it, and so, this is the woman who's lived with this for 12 years. And they didn't have, I'll say it this way, ladies, the tools you have today. The brothers don't get it, but you do. Some of the brothers say, no, I know what you're talking about. Don't say it. Just think with me. <laughs> this is a major issue in her life. And what's amazing, it implies that she had some resources. She spent all her livelihood, so somehow she got an inheritance or something. And for a woman in this culture, that's a big deal. So what she did, at, whether her dad died or some, some guy, her father or something died, and she got all this, whatever she got, and now all of that's been spent. So you got a physical issue, and you don't have any money, which means you have no dignity left. In this culture, you have nowhere to go. So here's a lady who's in a bad place, and she is therefore desperate. Who's more desperate, the guy whose daughter's dying or her? Everybody's desperate in their circumstance. Everybody feels equally as pained as you. You may want to be the star of the show. Nobody knows what I'm going through. It's all me. You are not the only one in here. Can I get an amen, somebody? You're heartbroken. You know when we got a heartbroken story. Some people in here gave all their heart to somebody, and they cheated on them, lied on them. Some people have to have money that's been stolen from them. Some people have lost opportunity, been lied on, been in prison for things they didn't do. Other people have a story, two stories, two desperate people. And what's amazing is they're both all in. Now watch what she does. We'll come back to him next week, but watch what she does. Verse 45. Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter <laughs> and those with him said, hey, master, the multitude uh, is all thronging around you, pressing on you. Uh, and uh, you say, who touched me? Like, what kind of question is that? And the response is profound. The response takes you into a spiritual dimension that sometimes we miss. Here's what he said. But Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I perceive the power going out from me. Somebody touched me, and I felt something leave me. Verse 47 when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him and declared these words. Declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. She said, let me, let me tell you what happened. I'm the one. Because I know how I felt before I came here. I know what an issue of blood feels like. I know how embarrassing this could be. And all I, I can tell you right now, I don't feel like I did when I came. Somebody, somebody helped me just a few minutes ago. And I want you to know, I'm the one who touched him. I don't know about you. Anybody can testify like that woman? I don't know about you, but I know what happened to me. I know how God delivered me. Come on, say amen. Somebody can say, you don't have to go to church. You don't have to worship if you don't want to. But for me, it changed my life. Come on, say amen, somebody. It helped lift my life. What's powerful is this is a woman who modeled something. This is what he said. Verse 48. And he said to her daughter, be of good cheer. Here's what helped you. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. Now, you, this has been so abused in some ways. 
and I don't think it was intentionally abused. I just think people just didn't get it. This is uh, about a person putting themselves in a place where God can work for them. If she didn't have enough faith to come to touch Jesus, if she didn't have enough faith to press through the crowd, if she didn't have enough faith to try one more time, if she didn't have the faith, it would never have happened. Some of you get so caught up on the healing, you're missing the message. If she didn't have enough faith to try one more time, if she didn't have enough faith to show up, if she didn't have enough faith, faith, faith to worship through the pain, if she didn't have enough faith to press past her, her embarrassment, she would never have been healed. Don't, get, don't go stick on the healing. See the process. Some of you don't hang around long enough. Some of you are not willing to go far enough. Some of you are not willing to be honest enough. And God can't help you because you don't give him anything to work with. Come on, you hear what I'm saying? You got to be there. I was in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I was asked to pioneer a church in Charlotte, North Carolina. I was asked, given a clear vision that they wanted me in Charlotte. But I was in Charlotte, and it was cold. And I couldn't find my way around. All the streets ran in each other. I loved some of the people I'd met there, but I did not want to live in Charlotte. And I began to pray, and I said, God, listen, I graduated from college now, so I'm supposed to be in the ministry. So what should I do? So I said, I don't want to be an evangelist. I don't like going from church to church to church to church to church. I'm sorry. I need one place. I need a foundation. So I decided that I would, by faith, go to a place I prayed for. See, I was, I was <laughs> oh, my goodness. I was, uh, there's more information than you need to know. <laughs> I'm about to bother you. I'm going to say something you don't need to know, so just pretend you don't know it. I was conceived in Fort Myers, Florida. See, I told you, you didn't know, didn't know that. I was conceived there and then brought here to Savannah to be born in shame. My mother was born pregnant in 1958, and she was pregnant with a little baby boy. And I had auntie here. And auntie brought my mama in on 40th off Geechee Road. That's right. And I was born in the front room of the house. Couldn't make it to the hospital. I was in a hurry. <laughs> Took me down to Charity Hospital, I think, to verify my existence. Signed my name and spelled it wrong. <laughs> R-I-C-A-R-D-O. It's R-E anyway. Who cares? Anyway, that's okay. Ricky Ricardo Temple was the name they gave me. And then my mother, after being here for a minute, she went and that great, I didn't know the Great Migration. You heard of that? The Great Migration where all the black folks were moving to the West. And my family was in that migration. 1964, the year that Jim Crow was made illegal. Isn't that something? Cool. So uh, we moved. We moved. Uh, you know, I traveled back and forth to Fort Myers because my we ain't long, who cares, back and forth. But anyway, we ended up moving to, moving to California. My auntie said, I'm going to California. Laura, why don't you go with us? Just ride. And then you catch the Greyhound back. Anybody know about the Greyhound? Kiss the ground back. Mama says, sure, I go. I'm going to go to California. Dude, why not go? Just go. So we went to California. I had two choices, California and New York. And auntie in California and Katie in, Cal in New York. And so I had a choice. God saved me. Took me to California. <laughs> Almost went to New York. But I, I, I remember we got there. And I remember landing in Santa Ana, California. Another aunt was there. And I was raised in, 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 in California. Never came back except to visit every now and then. But God had an eternal plan. God said, I wanted to be born in Savannah, the place he was to be born in shame. I wanted to be born there. And then he, after down the road, the Holy Spirit took me to, 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 to come back to visit. My mother came back to said, we're going to move home. I was about 15. He said, we're going to move home. Time to go back home. You know how you get that feeling? Say, go back home. You didn't say it. Come on, say, go back home. You ever felt that feeling? Going back home, going back to the South. So my mother packed up, grew up in L.A., grew up, grew up around all the Hollywood stuff, grew up around all that, felt so good, loved L.A. And she said, I'm moving, I'm moving back to the South. So I came back here, and I said, oh, Jesus, so get your road, Jesus. <laughs> oh, God, I'm here in the South. <laughs> south. Why, what is it, Nogichi? Anyway, so, I, we, so we landed, and um, 
And I stayed here for 24 months. Say 24 months. 24 months. Now that was for a reason. God said, if I don't take him back, he'll never fall in love. If I don't take him back, he'll never know about Savannah. He'll never know anybody. He'll never meet anybody. I need him to fall in love. Plus, he's unchurched. He don't go to church. We got to get this boy in church. If we don't get him in church, he's going to be a heathen. <laughs> so I came here, and I went to a Pentecostal church, Pastor Idel Cheever. Y'all know her name? Amen. I went there because my cousin was there, and I went to that church. And see, prior to that, God had already dealt with me. I told you my story, how God had dealt with me about a year before. I came to Christ before that. Didn't know I came to Christ. I prayed to send this prayer and everything. Didn't know it. But anyway, fast forward. So I'm here. I'm in, I'm in Savannah, and I fall in love with people. Then I leave here, go back to L.A., graduate from high school, and I go on to college, and I end up uh, studying theology. And then I go to a, I have a class. It's called a missions class. Can you say missions? missions? And in missions class, the professor said, you have to pick a city that you're going to pray for, that God would bring revival in that city. And I want everybody in here to pick a city. And you know what city I picked? Savannah, because I've been in Savannah for those two years. And I prayed, oh, God, raise up leaders in Savannah. Oh, God, bring revival in Savannah. I had no idea he's going to send me back to Savannah. <laughs> Fast forward. Fast forward. I go, to, I go to college, graduate that May. And in that May, now about in the, between that, let me stack up a little bit, I came to preach at the churches here uh, because I started preaching right after I got in college. And they said, won't you come back and do a revival? So I went and did revivals for Pastor Cheever and some other churches around here. And I'd come back in town and flying, and, and I was Evangelist Temple. And I used to preach the walls down. I used to say, well, God is a good God. Can you say yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so, so I would run revivals, and I would preach. And then uh, somewhere in 1979, I came to run revivals. I had booked up, because I was, I was in college, but I booked up the summer, you know, a little itinerary. And I was coming to Savannah, South Carolina. I had some in North Carolina, Northern California. And I came here. And a guy stopped and said, I want you. Uh, I heard this guy, Ricky Temple's in town. Uh, do you think he'll come preach for my Bible study? And he said, uh, I said, well, yeah, I'd be happy to. A friend of mine asked me, I said, I'd be happy. Well, well, come by and meet me on Sunday at about three, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. So I said, well, I'll, I'll go by his house. And I went by his house with a friend of mine, walked in, knocked on the door. He said, oh, he's not here. He forgot he has a Bible study he's doing for a new uh, Bible study that's happening called Overcoming Faith. They're meeting in Thunderbolt at a house. And so I said, that sounds like a long way away. Uh, Thunderbolt sounds like a long way away. <laughs> and my friend said, no, it's not that far. It's right down the street. I can take you there. So I walked to this, drove me there, got out the car, walked to the door. And walked in, knocked and walked in, and they were singing. There was a woman up there talking named Diane <laughs> Temple. Then it was Brian. <laughs> and I walked in, they were singing, This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice. And that, that was the day. Walked in there, sat through the Bible study, and there's a guy named James leading the Bible study at four o'clock. And he said, I want you to know before we leave here today, I see something. I want to get up and make a profession, confession. He said, I see growth. I see buildings. I see thousands of people. And I said, I see a few people in the house. That's <laughs> <laughs> I see. Come on, say, but God, but God had, a had a plan. God, God had something in mind. Something. And so afterward, Diane came up to me. Hi there. She thought I was a high school student because I looked real young. I did. I looked real young. And she came and she said, she said how are you? Because now she was, a, you know, she was a high school professor, te teacher, science teacher. And so she wanted to greet the young man who came in, <laughs> not knowing that that was her man. <laughs> see me moonwalking, don't you see that? That's the moonwalk. <laughs> she was, her man was in the building. Why are you moaning? This is my story. I'm telling it like I want to tell it. I went to Savannah by faith. I went to college by faith. I went to Charlotte by faith. 
And that moment when I was in Charlotte deciding, after I met Diane, we got married, moved to L.A. that December, a year later, a year and a half later, we got married, moved to L.A., and I graduated that May. I married in December and graduated that May. And in May, I moved to Charlotte. You tracking with me? Say amen if you are. Amen. When I got to Charlotte, I was making that decision. God, I don't want to evangelize. I don't want to be, where, where can I go? What city did you pray for when you were in college? Pray for Savannah. Why don't you go there and start a church? So I called Diane's mama. We started a Bible study. 45 people in it. 75 or so members. She said, I said, I'm coming to Savannah, and I think I'm going to start a Bible study, start a church. I'm going to meet in a hotel. She said, oh, no. Oh, no. We've been praying for someone just like you all these years. I want you five years. We've been praying. She said, I want you to come take this church. And she said, have at it, brother. I did my best. God bless you. And she gave it to me, and it's been history ever since. Can we say amen? But here's, what I'm, here's my point. It took faith, and that's what got this girl healed. Faith to go forward. Faith to work with what's in front of you. Faith, and let me tell you, you may not know the way. You may not be able to see. Come here, my brother. Come here. You may not be able to see. You may not know where you're going. Close your eyes. Point that way. Just trust me. Put, look at your hand. He got the vision. Don't, I like it. Go that way. Close your eyes. So you can't see, but I'm guiding you. You have to believe. You have to believe I'm not going to hurt you. You have to believe. You can't see. You don't know. Ah, stop. You can't see. Open your eyes. Look down. See, there you go. Come on, say, by faith. Thanks, my brother. Come on, say, by faith. Come on, by faith. Stand up on your feet. Give God a big hand clap. Come on, give God a big praise. Come on, shout. Come on, give God a big praise. Come on, God, you're able. I can't see everything. I don't know everything, but I know you're guiding me. I know your hand is on my life. I don't know. I don't know. My mind's everywhere, but I trust you. Through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, I've learned to depend upon his word. I've watched him bring me from there to here. Bring me through all those different steps. How did I get here? By faith. Right now, you're going to have to learn to lay it down and say, by faith, I trust you. I lay, all down, lay down all my fears. Father, we leave today believing that your hand is on us. Believing that as we take communion in just one minute, we're going to say to you that we are there. As a matter of fact, have a seat. Grab your communion real quick. I want to do this right now. Have a seat. I'm going to change this up. I, I, this is the moment we need to do this. If you don't have a communion, raise your hand. If you didn't get one when you came in, if you're home, go to the kitchen. Go to the kitchen. Get you some juice. Get your bread. By faith, you, you're saying, I know he died for me. The bread is a symbol of his body broken for you. The juice is life given for you. You believe that God's hands on your life. Things don't look wonderful. Maybe you're going through a physical challenge, whatever it is, by faith. Maybe you're the one with the issue of blood. Maybe you're the one who's lost a loved one. Or you have a loved one who's ill, like Jairus. See, what's powerful in this right now, if you think about it for a minute, we forgot all about him. We come back to him next week. You ever felt like he was on next week's schedule? You know it ain't this week. <laughs> but God hasn't forgotten about you. Father, we partake today of communion. The bread is a symbol of your body. The juice is a symbol of your life. We acknowledge you today. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your sacrifice. In Jesus' name. Communion is not for perfect people. It's for honest people. People who admit that they need God's hand. So we thank you. We praise you. We give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, shout amen. amen. Shout it again. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. You may stand.
If you don't know Christ, what better time than say it now? Jesus, I need you in my life. I surrender my life to you. I ask you to be the Lord of my life from this day forward. I come by faith with my imperfections and my life issues. And Father, I praise you and thank you for your grace, for forgiving me. Let that be your prayer. If you're in this building right now, let that be your prayer today. That this will be the day you start your walk with God. And Father, we give you praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. It's been fun.